All right. Let's see. Uh, this doesn't look right. I think. Let's see if I can. Can you guys see the presentation right, or is something going on? Yeah, we can see the slide. All right. Let's go. All right. So, all right. Let's <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. First of all, thanks. Thank you guys for having me present here. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to to um, talk about temporal uh, and which is an open source, reliable, scalable microservice orchestration platform. And hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will see you know, the parts of the reliable and scalable and stuff like that, and, and why does that matter and how Temporal solves those particular issues. Um, my name is Tiho Mishradilovic. I'm a developer advocate at Temporal. I'm also a project lead at um, CNCF Serverless Workflow Specification. And here's my tag if you, if you want to follow or, or you know, say hello. Um, about Temporal, just a couple of links. Uh, if you're interested or after this talk you want to learn more about it, uh, here's some notable links like the website, of course, docs, uh, the meetups. We have monthly meetups, so if you want to meet the team or meet the rest of the team from Temporal and, and, and ask any questions, you're more than welcome to do that too. Um, for any questions that you might not want, you know, kind of private or whatever, if you have, you can always email at product at Temporal IO as well. Um, in addition to, you know, kind of like things that I'm going to talk about today, you can see a bunch of different case studies by different companies who are using Temporal in production. And um, you can go to, to the website and access them and read how, you know, the different use cases and how different companies uh, are utilizing uh, Temporal. Now, when we talk about Temporal, it's really two things. We talk about the server and the different SDKs. The server itself is just a Golang binary. It, there is nothing to it. And you can deploy this binary on Kubernetes. You can deploy it on Docker. You can deploy it really on any infrastructure that you currently have available. In addition to that, uh, Temporal provides a, a cloud platform where you know if you don't want to deploy it yourself, and, and, and you can deploy it on the Temporal cloud and, and, and run, um, you know, use that uh, for your applications as well. As far as the SDKs goes, Temporal currently has four SDKs, Go, PHP, Java, and Node. And it's just like the same thing. Since you're, you're using a programming language approach to write your business applications, you can deploy uh, them still on any framework that you currently have existing or any, or, you know, or, or tested and deployed on any infrastructure you currently have available. So Temporal is not uh, restricting you in that way, in any sort of way. Uh, so we talked about the temporal server, what it is, kind of on the high level. But let's kind of like take a little bit look inside. So the server is composed of of five different services. They're independent services that communicate with each other. Uh, to the front end service, and we'll talk about what each one does. But the basic idea is that you have full control of your server uh, scalability, in terms of horizontal scaling by deploying your server on, on multiple nodes, for example. And you also have horizontal scale, uh, vertical scaling by being able to replicate, for example, each of the internal services of the server, and that that way achieve scalability of, of uh, your applications as well. So let's just quickly look at each parts of the service. So the front end service is basically basically a GR, uh, exposes a gRPC API that your application that you run actually can communicate with the server with. Um, so all inbound calls uh, from, from your client application, from the microservices you're developing um, can communicate with this front end service. So the history service deals with things like workflow or, or your business logic state transitions. So here, you know, the state of your, or, of your current execution of your different implementation is stored and things like that. You have a matching service. That is the service that actually controls the execution of uh, parts of, of, of your business logic applications. So and this will be more clear here in a minute. And, 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 and uh, basically, parts of your application communicate this, with this as well. And then we have the internal worker service, which does some background processes, replication, and blah, blah, blah. As far as the database goes, uh, Temporal supports uh, Cassandra, MySQL, and PostgreSQL for persistence. And the database stores a lot of different things like your, your task, workflow task, like what's currently happening, what should happen, what has happened so far, the data that uh, is local to your business logic or uh, the data of, of your different executions, the events that are happening during the execution of your applications, and also stores a bunch of different visibility data that we'll take a look at as well. Uh, the scaling of the database 
part of the temporal server really depends on which database you use. So it's going to be a different scaling factor if you, for example, use Cassandra versus MySQL. Um, as far as observability goes, that's always important. The temporal server itself emits, uh, and as well as the SDK, emit a ton of different metrics out of the box. So there's nothing really that uh, you have to set up on the server and on the SDK side, since those are your applications, you just have to you know, say which metrics you want to actually use or not. And these metrics, of course, you know, especially for the server side, you know, uh, you can easily uh, scrape with Prometheus and also define a different dashboards with Grafana, for example, your favorite uh, metrics systems. Um, in addition to, to, to metrics, the, the out of the box, when you do your uh, work with, with the temporal SDKs, you, you get tracing, so you can trace your executions of your applications on things like Jaeger and stuff like that. Now, let's take a look. I like to take an approach. Let's see uh, how, what temporal server really looks at from a different perspective or user perspective. So if you are a developer and, and, and you really want to focus only on writing your business logic or implement the requirements that you have to do for your application that whatever company you work at, the temporal server really looks something like, okay, I don't have to worry about things like event handling, dealing with timers, dealing with actually storing anything in my application, transaction management, the temporal server is fully transactional um, and things like that. I don't have to deal with like, for example, if I'm calling multiple services in my applications, I don't have to deal with any uh, uh, any queuing systems. And also, like we saw, we don't have to really wor worry when we write our code about things like analytics and metrics that come out of the box for you. Now, temporal server is not kind of like a joke. And, and, and because of the scaling factor, which can happen on both the server end and of course of, also on your application end, you're actually able to execute hundreds of millions of these business logics or these workflows concurrently. So this is kind of like a very interesting approach that you have something so powerful that you can really write your applications and scale them uh, on, on, on a very high level. Now, the temporal server itself does not execute your code directly. It more like guides your execution of your code, but there's still code is executing on your servers and, and, and on your deployments. The temporal server then tracks and manages your application and also its state. Now, <laughs> at the same time, if we look at, for example, the SDKs, as a developer, when you write your logic, you can still use your programming language. You can still write your apps in Go, PHP, Node, Java, or if you have polyglot type of applications, you can use multiple of these languages. <clears throat> the SDKs of Temporal uh, provide you, you know, of course, you have the capabilities of programming language, but in addition to that, you have um, very easy approach, and we'll take a look at that in a second for development, testing, and also writing your client applications that need to interact with your services and things that you have. Now, from developer perspective, you know, and, and the reason why I show that really is a lot of times when you're developing or adopting some sort of workflow solutions, you're a lot of times bound to a lot, you know, the, the, the um, overall um, development environment and things of that workflow runtime. With Temporal, it's not really the case. You can still use your favorite ID in case this is IntelliJ, but whatever you're, you're using, you don't have to get out of that environment. Um, and you're really concerned about writing three things. The first one is, of course, workflows, which is deterministic implementations of your business logic. You have to uh, think about orchestration. So how in your, during your business logic, you're orchestrating, for example, invocations of different services, which we'll say see are called activities within Temporal. And you can write fully fault-tolerant control for logic. So it has full support, of course, of the programming language constructs, object-oriented constructs, but in addition for, for things like automatic retries, cron and timeout execution, based execution, um, compensation, uh, fully sync and fully async invocations, as well as, of course, parallel invocations of your services. Like we said, you can use all the OO features of your programming language that you're that you're using. And you also have, for example, database conditional weights and sleeps and stuff like that, all built in without you actually having to worry about how that happens behind the scenes. 
Now, as far as the activities goes or the parts of your application, they're supposed to do things like file access, uh, invocation of third-party services and stuff like that. There you can really have non-deterministic or really any code type of approach. This is your, you can, you know, we have people integration uh, of temporal with different frameworks. And, you know, Red Hat is a big Java shop. So, you know, things like Spring Boot or, or Quarks even and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and again, you have full sync and async approach, you know, depending on, of course, your programming language used and, and stuff like that. The third thing is, of course, your, your workers. Um, these are uh, processes that host your workflows and activities. They communicate to uh, the temporal server, uh, gRPC, of course, uh, using long polling, and they provide full data privacy. So even if you have a, a temporal server, your application has some uh, privacy or, or private information that you don't want to secure information that you want to share. You can encrypt it on your end. So the temporal server when it st saves your uh, state of your application and stuff like that, there is nothing there that, that is stored that you don't want to. Now, as far as from the app development perspective, you have a web UI where, you know, this is kind of typical for anything where you can use to, to, to uh, monitor what's going on, what uh, workflows or applications are running, which ones are not. You can look their full uh, histories of, as far as events would happen. You can see even stack traces and stuff like that. And also even more powerful is a CLI that you get also for free, <laughs> it's all open source. Um, and you can actually um, do everything that you can do in the web UI even more like execute batch commands and stuff like that as well. Now, as far as app testing and debugging, which is very important in any workflow system, this is probably the one thing that is probably, you know, differs a lot between different implementations. As far as temporal goes, since again, you're using a programming language approach, you have full support to use your favorite IDs, your favorite debuggers, your favorite testing frameworks and things like that. And again, workflows can be tested, they can be mocked. And uh, Temporal SDKs also provide a uh, testing API where you can test your workflows or their mocks without actually a server running. So it has an internal built-in uh, capability so you can even run your tests offline. Same thing for activities that can be tested independently. Um, different, You can test different timeout options and stuff like that. Now, so we saw this from the development perspective. What about some sort of architect perspective? Or the, you know, I know now developers really do everything, but still kind of like this approach of, of, of thinking about building some frameworks or higher level concepts to build your applications. So the first thing we probably want to think about, hey, can I use my existing frameworks that I use? And, and this is especially true if you already have an existing application and you want to start introducing temporal or as a technology into your system. And the answer is yes, uh, because of the uh, way that Temporal uh, is, again, a programming language approach, you can use it in any framework that you currently have. There's no problem with that. The second thing, hey, can I still use my existing programming languages? A lot of workflow solutions force you to kind of do uh, uh, develop in a way that you're not uh, currently doing it. And you have to basically adopt a whole new development model in order to, to, to start utilizing these runtimes and their services. So from this part as the temporal goes as an architect, you can continue uh, using your existing programming languages, um, or if you're thinking about new applications, you can really write them in the way that, that makes more sense to you, given the development team that you have currently available. As far as the dev environment, hey, can I still use my IDs? Can I still deploy to Kubernetes? Can I still deploy my applications to test them on the frameworks that I currently have going on? And again, the, the answer is yes. There is no restrictions that Temporal imposes onto anybody really in order to, to, to adopt it and start using it. Um, and so again, of course, testing, can I still use JUnit? Can I use Testify? Can I use PHP unit? Things like that. And the answer is again, yes, you can test the applications using your favorite testing framework and debug it inside of your IDs as we saw earlier. So as far as, uh, you know, adopting any technology into some, something that you haven't written yet or something that you knew is, is fairly easy, but the problem always becomes, hey, I have existing applications. And this is kind of like, you know, not that, like how every application is, but overall uh, is you have some sort of data models on the left in this circle, some sort of eventing platform where you're getting events from 
internally you have your object model or the representation of your business requirements and the thing that actually makes your applications tick or work or what they actually do that that is is, is your knowledge of your company and then, then of course your code wants to communicate with some third-party services uis and stuff like that so from the perspective of of um adopting temporal into an existing applications really all you have to worry about which parts of your applications i want to turn into workflows or the core orchestration of your business logic that that uh, it, it does uh, and which parts of applications you want to turn into activities, or as we said, parts of applications which are responsible to communicate with, with third-party systems, UIs, file access, database access, and stuff like that. So now that we've seen all this, now what's still the core value proposition of Temporal? And the core value proposition is really as if you're a developer, if you're an if you're whoever, it doesn't really matter, it's all really mixed, we want to write our applications or our services the way we want to write it, right? And the value proposition of Temporal is that by using Temporal, you can have your services or applications that you run fully durable, fault tolerant. Uh, they can, um, you know, even if you if you have some outages for three, for five minutes or five months, you can still restore your applications to the state where where the failure happened and continue their executions. You have fully distributed uh, way of writing services without even thinking about it. You know, you don't have some, you to have five frameworks and, 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 you know, whatever. You can choose what you want. You still have fully distributed applications. You can scale your applications, like we said, to execute millions of workloads concurrently. So it's very high scale. And of course, you can write your services polyglot. And, and the reason why I put that is, again, a lot of runtimes restrict your single, um, way of developing the single way of single programming language or approach, but again, we, we saw it temporal, you can use currently four, and I'm sure in the future, there'll be even more programming languages that, can, that will be supported. Now, let you know, again, let's take a look a little bit about how this works. So on the left-hand side, we have some sort of business class. This could be any class, it was, again, Java, but it could be again, Go or PHP or whatever. Uh, where I have some my customer class, and this is my current code that I have in my application. It needs to update some account, and you know we have a get customer method which returns, so some sort of way to return some information, and we have some exit method here, which it typically could be triggered by a signal, for example, from 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 some sort of messaging service. Now. <laughs> we have some, of course, in Java, but this will be a little different in Go, for example. We have some sort of interface. Again, this is our code that we currently have that has nothing to do with Temporal that describes the, the methods of, of, of our business class that we, that we have. So basically, first thing we have to do is we want to turn this into a workflow interface. So just with a couple of annotations at workflow interface, at workflow method, Query method, for example, the get customer that returns could be become a query method where, you know, and also we have a signal method, meaning that our exit method can receive signals from uh, from from um, different sources. And just with that, we've turned really our my customer class on the left into a temporal workflow. Now, of course, we have to still uh, think about what did we gain with that? Well, with just this little small changes, our my customer class now can be long running. It can run for years, you know, without uh, <laughs> without really thinking about much uh, resources, on, especially on our side. It is fully stateful, so all the uh, local information, uh, uh, local variables, all for our persist persisted without us really thinking about database. Becomes fault tolerant completely. So if if something breaks during the middle of execution, you can easily re re. Uh, uh, reinstate, you know, replay the state and and continue its execution. It can be invoke sync or async without us even thinking about using some sort of frameworks for that. It can be fully versioned and also fully testable. But of course, we still have to say, okay, how do I interact with this thing once I have my workflow? And how can I actually write my business logic so it's deterministic? And we'll talk about the deterministic factor of temporal here in a minute as well. Now, the next thing, okay, now I've written my workflows, how can I actually interact with them? On the left-hand side, we have like a box that represents our client application. Our client application wants to start some workflow, stop and interact with them. On the right-hand side, we have, have the temporal server. 
So uh, the temporal SDKs provide APIs to send commands to the temporal server. That can be, for example, start command, or there's a bunch of other different commands, and there is many, many more. Uh, so let's say through the code we have here workflow client, client dot start. So we want to start a particular execution of the workflow. This command is sent to the server, which is then going to schedule actually the execution of our workflow uh, by placing uh, on the right hand side a little dot uh, a task onto the a task queue. Now on the bottom right we see our application code, which again is a is a combination of of your workflows and activities and your workers. Our worker is going to a long poll for this task, wait for it. When he receives it, is going to get any information out of this task and is going to uh, then determine uh, what to do. Should we execute a workflow? Should we sch schedule an activity? Should we just go ahead and do nothing? <laughs> you know, if, if we have a long sleep or a wait in our, in, 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 in our workflow execution and things like that. Um, now, once this task has been completed on your application code, your application can send, uh, again, commands to the server. The server figures out if it needs to, for example, create timers, if it needs to persist things, whatever it needs to do, and it can put another task uh, onto the task queue, which is then again consumed by the worker and then continues the execution of, of, of your workflows and activities. Now, on the right hand side, we see kind of like the continu continuation of the previous slide. So let's say a task arrives, our worker has pulled a task, he has received a new task onto whatever task you is listening to. Now, important thing here is that Temporal is a fully distributed system. So this particular app code could be something completely different. Or in case, let's say your application code crashed and you redeployed somewhere completely different, again, this application and the worker can still listen to the queue when it comes back up and receive the workflow task from the server and continue execution of your workflows. So the workflow task itself includes things like, okay, what are we supposed to do next as far as the execution of your application goes, but also includes information about past events and what has happened so far. And especially these past events uh, allow us to replay our current execution to the point of where it either needs to proceed further or for example, in case of failure where it has crashed and now we have uh, uh, fully preserved the workflow state, let's say on the left-hand side, we see customer activities, update customer account. This is kind of either where we need to continue execution or let's say in case of failure, we, we recovered from it and want to continue execution as well. So <laughs> the replay really allows us to preserve what has happened so far without re-executing everything twice. Uh, so Temporal uh, provides a, uh, at most once execution of your activities, for example. So the replay doesn't call your services five times and you have unexpected results. But anyway, so if so far the, the past events match the execution of your workflow execution so far, the workflow is, 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 de is deterministic, which means everything that happened so far matches with the event history of what, what, what happened. And the workflow can continue execution according to the what's next information. If it's non-deterministic, that means you either introduce some change and things like that, and, and, and the workflow is going to fail in this case. Um, so what about microservice orchestration? Well, this is kind of like the typical part or how do we write our ser uh, microservices. Well, let's say we have a food delivery service on the top left part, which again can be polyglot completely, and our application orchestrates third-party services that we don't really control, such as dispatch, restaurant, payment, and blah, blah, blah. And the typical, this is kind of like the typical way of writing things. Well, you can still use this with Temporal, and you still have the ability uh, out of the box uh, to deal with intermittent failure with, for example, automatic retries of your activities. So let's say dispatch service has an intermittent error, it's down, you get automatic retries, you can also configure those retries and stuff like that. And, 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 and retry until the dispatch service comes back up. You can also deal with continuing failure. Let's say our payment service is down for, for weeks and we just can't recover from it. You can you know, easily configure things like um, uh, some sort of saga patterns or something to compensate uh, the work that has been done so far. Another thing that Temporal allows you to do, which is really key, is rate limiting. So for example, you don't want to write your food delivery service to bomb, let's say the payment service or, or the dispatch service, you can easily configure rate limiting, uh, which can also save you, for example, cost in the long run if you don't want to hit some service over some amount of time per 
uh, numbers of times over some period of time. Now, where Temporal really shines uh, is a microservice orchestration where multiple service microservices that you write are connected to the Temporal server and using the Temporal server. In this case, we have on the left-hand side our food delivery server, which is, let's say, has a workflow and its work for, work for workers sorry, uh, talks to the, to the Temporal server. On the right-hand side, we have a dispatch service. Now, dispatch service can be written by you know different company can be different different department in your in your company whatever it, it, it's a completely separate team for example that writes the dispatch service but they can together using temporal and its sdks communicate with a single server and what that allows you to do is again you can for example rate limit each service individually rather than you know as we've seen before your food delivery service having to deal with rate limiting third party services you have full error handling and propagation between, for example, the dispatch service and the food delivery service. And we'll take a look at that in the next slide. Um, and again, the polygon aspect, you can write one application or the food delivery service in Go, you can write the dispatch service in Node.js if that's what your teams are working on, and you can still communicate with each other without any issues. Now, one thing about error propagation and chaining across polygon microservices, this is super hard to do typically. You, you usually when you when you have polygon services, you have to deal with like you know some either some sort of JSON or or you have to deal with uh, error messages being in some sort of string format and, and communicate with that. With Temporal, it's not really like that. Let's say we have a food delivery service again on the top left, which is written in Go, and our workflow let's say uh, invokes an activity. And this activity, uh, of course, through the temporal server invokes the restaurant service workflow, which is written in Node.js. That thing calls its activity and then again invokes <coughs> a work or just an activity of our payment service, which is written in PHP. Now, what happens actually when the payment service goes down or has an error? Well, at this point, what do you do typically in your applications right now? With Temporal, especially if all of them are using the Temporal SDKs and communicating with a Temporal server, you can easily uh, propagate uh, these errors back. So, for example, the account, uh, activity in a restaurant service can catch this exception uh, in the PHP workflow. It can add some data to it. Then it can propagate it back to the restaurant service workflow execution. This can propagate back. Again, this is Node.js now that we're talking about back to the uh, activity of the food delivery service. And finally, uh, our initial workflow, which, which started the, the orchestration of this particular uh, microservice, my, different microservice can get the error. And it can, what, when it gets the error, it's not like a 404, it's not like service not available. It's a full error that has the payment service error, it includes things like the original error from the PHP uh, payment service, uh, the account information from the restaurant service, the amount paid from the restaurant service, and things like uh, that, and and it can it, it can you basically you have full control at this point uh, with this error what you can do, uh, and and then again this is polyglot across across different microservices as well. So that's kind of it for, for what I have. I have also a short demo, but I don't know if you're out of time or not. I apologize if we are. Uh, moderators, please let me know. And for more information about Temporal, if you're interested, go to docs.temporal.io uh, and get in touch again on the community site and, and Luma if, you, if you're interested in meeting the team and, and joining the monthly um, meetings. I do have a demo, but again, you know, moderators, let me know. Uh, yeah, so uh, the time slot is up, but I don't think we have any other um, talks in this track at 10 a.m. So if you want, you can go ahead with the demo. And um, if people want to attend a different talk, they might head out. Uh, yeah, before you do that, though, do you want to answer some of the questions? Yeah, definitely. Mentioned? Yeah. Uh, are they all in chat? Sorry, I'm, I'm trying uh, to... Yeah, I can just read it out to you. No, so one of the right. questions is, um, are workflows meant to supersede web frameworks? That is, instead of writing application code in a web framework like uh, Laravel, PHP, I write a workflow that runs some business logic? Um, if I understand, the no uh 
the workflows are really just the core implementation of your business logic. You can still use a web framework to expose them to your customers. So a lot of times when you use things like some web frameworks, whatever the web framework would be, you can still use it. Uh, you can define REST endpoints that make sense to your application that you're expo exposed to your end users. And when they hit that endpoint, they can actually invoke a, a, a work, different workflows or the or, or or the core implementations of your business logic. And again, with Temporal, you know, web server, you know, if you have some sort of web framework where where you just you know get some requests from a customer and run some code, you have that still. But you also with Temporal, you have full fault tolerance. You can deal again with, like we show with 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 being completely resilient. And even if your web request fails, you can do automatic retries and, and recovery and stuff like that. And then finally, uh, be able to respond back to your web uh, framework to your users. Does that answer your question? All right. I'm um, assuming that. yes, they, if they don't say anything in the chat. Um, so uh, they also have another question, which is how does Temporal fit with container orchestration or management tools like Kubernetes? Uh, thank you for the question. That was very nice. Um, it, as we said, the temporal server does not really restrict uh, the frameworks that you use. Uh, temporal does have out of the box uh, Helm charts uh, support for the community, so you can deploy your servers on Kubernetes if you wish to, and you can also, of course, deploy your applications uh, with your workloads and everything on Kubernetes too. It is one way of deploying, and I think most of the uh, companies that we have seen they, that they use Temporal, yeah, they probably deployed on Kubernetes or some other sort of uh, system uh, that is similar. All right, and I think the last question is, uh, can we uh, able to do a micro front-end app structure using Kubernetes? Um, I have to be honest, I don't really know what the micro front-end app structure using Kubernetes is, but uh, again, uh, with Temporal, your applications are your applications. As we said, you deploy them any way you want to. The only thing you have to do is 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 make sure that uh, you can you know of course communicate with the portal server or a cluster of temporal servers um that that allow you to 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 have all this uh benefits of using it um so i just see another question come in uh, i'm not sure if um this is going to be something related to temporal but um why windows why does Windows have issues with Kubernetes in handling load balancing of pods? Um, yeah. I'm not really sure. It's probably a Kubernetes question more than a temporal question. Yeah. Um, um, so I'm not really sure how to answer that one. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and just a clarifying question. Uh, so workflow workflows are more like task runners. Is that correct? Um, the the workers uh more than anything uh so basically like we said temporal server does not execute your code your 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 applications are still executing the code so what happens is is um let's say you have uh a wait in your in your business logic so let's say what you wait for a week right your worker is going to make sure that the timer is actually created on the on the server it's, and it's going to uh, hold the execution of 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 your workflow your business logic for as long time as you specified of course in, in your code in the end during that time there is not going to be any resource utilization so this is kind of like this whole kubernetes and scaling to zero thing while let's say your workflow and your applications again waits on something perform some sort of time timer um um work where you either wait for an event for a certain number of time or there is just simply no execution there for for a long running workflow there is nothing going to be utilized under your application resource end so that's kind of like hopefully answers your question so in a way yeah you would be kind of like a task runner but that's more of the part of your of your worker part and again you can scale your workers any way you want in your applications and we see that all the time where it's scalability is not only on the server temporal server side but you, for example you can have a whole fleet of workers uh, for the same application and you can really say okay I want this workflow to run on this worker these workflows and activities on this worker and you can scale your applications 
and a very high level in order to utilize uh, or have high performance or throughput for, for your customers. All right, I think that was all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for answering. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you want to go ahead with the demo, I think we can do it. Um, but there is a keynote starting at 1030. So uh, well, it's, it doesn't, what I'll do then, uh, I'm, I apologize, but what I will do, and I'll do the demo if, you know, next time, uh, I'm, I apologize, I didn't, I didn't know, and thank you again for allowing me to talk over the time. I did want to show you, uh, the demo is basically that I wanted to show is a polyglot application using the temporal Java Go and, and PHP SDKs, and it's just a game. I, don't, I like to do kind of sure, small sure. Yeah. when I do things. But it is on GitHub. You can uh, go to this URL here on the GitHub. Oh, we cannot see anything on the screen, by the way. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, am I not sharing it? Let me try to share it again. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Is that OK? Yeah, yeah that, that's perfect. Yeah. So here you go for anybody interested. This is GitHub repo for the demo. And it has clear instructions. and. Also, if you go to the Pora YouTube channel, I do have a video that 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 shows the demo off as well. So you know, you guys are awesome. not missing anything. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, appreciated having me. Uh, I I you know I'm ha happy to to be here again. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. If not, uh, have a great day and great rest of the the, the conference. Yeah, thank you so much.